Hello, everyone, and welcome to Increasing Equitable Infrastructure Investments in Underserved Communities with the Council on Foundations and the Department of Transportation. I'll now turn it over to Stephanie Powers, Senior Advisor for Public Policy and Partnerships at the Council on Foundations. Thank you, Caroline, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Powers, and I'm the Senior Advisor for Public Policy and Partnerships at the council and I'm your host and moderator for this event today. I wanna to thank you for joining us to talk with colleagues from the US Department of Transportation about the initiatives they have intentionally designed to increase equity in the distribution of the new funding available through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021, a $1.2 trillion cross-government investment. This is your chance as funders to talk to the architects of the Department of Transportation's very significant role in this historic federal opportunity. So I encourage you to join in the conversation today to exchange ideas about equity, community resilience, climate change reforms, a good topic for a very hot summer in the United States and around the world, and workforce development, and how philanthropic funders can show up in this work. And it's not just about money to fill gaps. There's important community leadership that philanthropy can exercise when local officials are looking for input on how and where to place the priorities in this money. There's very important community engagement that brings non-traditional voices to the, tradition, to the decision-making tables. And there are certainly lessons to share that foundations have learned from their similar investments. First, we will hear from our federal colleagues about their perspectives on the need for public, private, and philanthropic partnerships. Today, we have Linda Tran, who is the Director of Public Engagement and a Senior Advisor to Secretary Pete Bouget. Maria Zimmerman, who's the Strategic Advisor for Technical Assistance and Community Solutions and Christopher Coes, who is the Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy. After we hear from them, we will open the mics for reaction and comments from you. Just raise your Zoom hand or put your comments and questions in the chat function, and I'm going to keep track of those. But we have three funders today who have graciously agreed to kick off the philanthropy response part of this conversation. So let me welcome them. Naomi Amaha, who is the Director of Policy and Government Affairs and Impact at the Denver Foundation. Crystal Bridgman, who is the Senior Director for Workforce Development at Siemens Foundation. And Shauna Bartley, who is a Policy Officer at the Kellogg Foundation. So with that, to get this conversation started, I'd like to turn the mic over to Linda. Welcome. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thanks to the entire Council and Foundations team for bringing everybody together for this conversation. We're excited to have a chance to go a little bit deeper than we've been able to do in some of the conversations to date and really to hear from you all what you're thinking about in terms of how to take part in this incredible historic moment. Um, just to kick things off here, uh, our colleague Charlene is going to start sharing her screen and you can move to the next slide. Uh, you want, we want to make sure that you understand uh, broadly the DOT approach on infrastructure implementation. And in order to do so, you need to understand how we see this moment, this opportunity, and the urgency of the work that we're doing right now. There are a few handful of uh, foundational principles that you see here on the screen that really ground our work. It's our belief that infrastructure is central to economic opportunity, to meeting climate goals. We were just chatting about um, the uh, overwhelming temperatures that folks are experiencing all around the world right now. And we feel that infrastructure investment is uh, a key part of uh, being able to address climate change challenges. And of course, it's also central to realizing equity for everyone. It goes without saying that the bipartisan infrastructure law is a very big deal, and not surprisingly, we feel that the time for action, the urgency, is right now. Next slide. 
So the data bear out this perspective. You see here are some uh, data from 2019 that really make the case that infrastructure is critical to opportunity writ large. As you see, transportation is and has been one of the largest expenditure categories for households around the country. It's second only to actually housing expenses, accounting for nearly $11,000 on average in 2019, or 15% of after-tax income. Uh, we also see that the lowest income households, the bottom bracket, spend an average of more than a third of their after-tax income on transportation compared to uh, just under a fifth by middle income households. And uh, equitable and high quality transportation systems can help address these disparities and increase residents' uh, upward economic mobility. I'm sure folks have heard the secretary speaking quite frequently about the connectivity of neighborhoods and uh, what that means in terms of economic opportunity. And my colleague's gonna speak more about that here shortly. Next slide. Uh, in the various meetings that we've had over the past year plus now, we have often been asked where we're focused. And uh, since the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law in particular, we've had many discussions with lots of you who are joining us and others about how external partners and collaborators can really support the efforts. You know, our priorities are reflected in what we're saying and where we're investing resources. So if you look at our words, our actions, and our investments, what we're funding, clearly the bipartisan infrastructure law or the IIJA, the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the projects that we're choosing to fund what we're doing, where we're doing, you know, I often say is, is candidly a, a sort of de-risked list of where our priorities are as a department and as an administration. In terms of what we're saying, there are a number of executive orders that uh, we are in the midst of implementing alongside our cabinet agency um, counterparts. Uh, we recently released our DOT strategic plan. We also recently released the DOT equity action plan, the first of its kind for the Department of Transportation. Uh, in January, we uh, put out our national roadway safety strategy, which is also the first of its kind as a roadmap for how we're uh, planning to uh, work with collaborators around the country to reduce roadway deaths and serious injuries. And uh, we are also very focused on the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, shorthand NEVI, uh, to build 500,000 electric vehicle chargers around the country. Uh, and we're very excited to be building out a technical assistance program. We're thrilled that uh, Maria Zimmerman, our colleague you'll hear from shortly, is leading that effort. Uh, we certainly are continuing to talk to all of you through my team at the Office of Public Engagement. We have recently stood up our Roots Council again, uh, which was uh, approved as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And we have uh, an unprecedented number of executive leadership positions that are focused explicitly on climate, labor and workforce, and safety. Next slide. The gravitational pull for all of this is, of course, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, and the list of superlatives is long. The bipartisan infrastructure law is the largest investment in our nation's aging infrastructure in decades, with $660 billion flowing through DOT over the next five years. And depending on what year you peg against, that's either 5X or 7X the budget that DOT has ever had. You know, the numbers are nothing short of eye-popping. You see some of them here. Uh, and to aggregate and um, give you a sense of the landscape here, this is the most money for roads since the uh, creation of the Eisenhower system. This is the most money for rail since the inception of Amtrak the most money ever for electric vehicles. It's the first climate title. And it's the first time that we have dedicated money to stitch together communities ripped apart by highways. Uh, not listed here, but also definitely worth noting, it's also the most money ever for public transit with $108 billion over the next five years. And so it goes without saying, this is a massive undertaking. There are 103 programs in the bipartisan infrastructure law and 46 of them are new. Um, you know, what you've heard is a lot about the um, big picture superlatives here. What you may not have heard enough is that uh, we really need your support and your partnership in order to be successful in implementing um, this legislation. So to say more about our values and our approach, I'm going to hand it over now to my colleague, the Assistant Secretary for Policy, Christopher Coates. Thank you, Linda, and thank you all uh, for allowing us to have this moment to uh, share a little insights of how we are uh, implementing the bipartisan infrastructure law. 
Um, as we continue to advance this work, it is really important. It's really important to recognize that past federal transportation investments have often, too often, failed to address the inequities or have actually created some of the challenges that we see today, particularly when it comes to economic disparities and also our, our climate crisis. And in many cases, we know um, that our infrastructure investments, even those that have, have happened in the last decade, have even made uh, those disparities worse. The department and the entire Biden-Harris administration are committed to doing the right thing for our shared future. Addressing these inequities, building a better and more equitable transportation system is what we are striving for. Um, as you see on the, uh, we can go to the next, I'm uh, oh, sorry. Um, as you can see here, um, as the administration, as many other agencies, um, the Department of Transportation made a huge milestone earlier this year, releasing our equity action plan, which we believe is a dramatic shift in how we, the Department of Transportation, believe we can deliver a more equitable transportation program. It highlights key actions that the department will undertake to expand access and opportunity to all communities while focusing on underserved, overburdened, and disadvantaged communities. The, action fall, the actions that we prescribe fall under four focus areas, wealth creation, power of community, interventions, and expanding access. Actions will include providing additional technical assistance to small disadvantaged businesses, reinvigorating our Title VI Civil Rights Act, launching a new National Technical Assistance Center, and developing um, metrics on reducing transportation costs in households. We have a long way to go to creating a truly equitable, a more safer transportation system, but the actions outlined in this plan form a very strong foundation. Next slide. One of the things that is, uh, one of the roles that I have at, at the department is working with the secretary to develop our overall strategic plan. And one of the things that we have done for the first time is prioritize equity as a department strategic goal. The various strategies, as you know, whether it's come safety, which is our North Star, whether it's promoting economic opportunity, whether it's actually ensuring that we are meeting the climate crisis, equity is at the forefront and, and, and essential and pillar of assuring that we do it right. Um, one of the key aspects of our strategy is ensuring that not only are we embedding equity in the entire fabric of the department, but we're doing it in a way that truly we are expanding the access for underserved communities and empowering communities to be more uh, empowered to be a part of the decision-making process. We at DOT understand we're trying to implement policies that drive a better outcome. While the bipartisan infrastructure law certainly provides an increase in much needed infrastructure funding so we can address the backlog of roads and bridges and buses and airports that are falling into disrepair. More funding alone does not guarantee more equitable outcomes. And we're going to use every tool in our toolkit, our hard, our soft power to do that. And as I said that to say, um, we've, from uh, FY21, we've been really uh, focused on updating our criteria to center equity in our grant making. We have been uh, ramping up our guidance to grantees to do better outcomes. We are accelerating our ability to expand technical assistance, whether it's directly to state DOTs, to MPOs and transit agencies, so they themselves can em em embrace uh, our approach. But more importantly, we're also thinking about how we can expand partnerships directly with local governments, community-based organizations who are really interested in following this agenda. Next slide. But it's, while we have uh, $650 billion within the 1.2 trillion, it is important to state that we cannot do this alone. We need your help. We need the philanthropic and community-based organizations to join in with the department, whether it's supporting technical assistance or helping provide a local match for grant applicants, whether it's actually doing what you're doing right now, helping coordinate, co-invest, build capacity with not only the public sector, community-based organizations, but also in the private sector. We're recognizing that as we are building the ship of creating a more safer, more equitable, more modern transportation system, we need to be able to document these stories, create narratives and language and research that really shows that this approach, this equitable transportation approach that we're trying to strive for really is the best way to go. Next slide. As I said before, we are really excited by the bipartisan infrastructure law and the opportunity that it presents to deliver on our equity and environmental justice commitments. 
As mentioned uh, by Linda, we are excited that the fact that we can create over 500,000 new EV chargers, expand transit into communities that have been underserved. But there are a number of programs that I would like to highlight here where we do see opportunity for a great alignment. The first being in our Reconnecting Communities program. Um, last month, the secretary was down in, uh, in Birmingham uh, with a number of us, which really, again, is a first of its kind ever program dedicated to removing portions of interstates or repurposing and redesigning rural mainstreams or uh, former rail lines to really uh, address those disparities, but also create new thriving communities. And this is gonna be one of the few programs that we have at the department where we can actually support planning and capital projects, not only with local project sponsors, but also community-based organizations. The second program um, that I would like to call out is our recent thriving communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to my dear colleague, Maria Zimmerman, uh, who's leading that effort for us. Maria? Great, thank you, Christopher. Um, so I was excited to be brought on a couple months ago as the strategic advisor for technical assistance. And part of this includes helping us to launch this new program. Uh, and it is one of several different things that we have underway in the department to really better support uh, the needs of disadvantaged communities and new grantees, uh, particularly local cities, local government, uh, which can be broadly uh, interpreted as that, to really make sure that they can access our resources, both to get funding, but also to deliver uh, successful projects. And with the Thriving Communities Initiative, as you can see here, this is actually language from, from Congress, from the statute, we have an exciting opportunity, not just to be supporting communities on transportation projects, but transportation projects that are serving a much broader set of community needs and goals, whether they relate to climate resiliency and sustainability, to public health, access to fresh foods, uh, economic development, education, and other important outcomes that communities feel are critical for their own goals and the future they're trying to create. We have $30 million for this initiative this year between us and between HUD, uh, and we're also um, requesting additional funding in the coming year. So let's look at the next slide, sorry about that. Um, our Thriving Communities Initiative is more than a single program. As mentioned, we're really seeing this as an opportunity to retool and rethink how we work with and support communities in providing technical assistance. So we just recently launched a new DOT navigator that's in its beta form, but you can see kind of the, the landing page here. Uh, what's exciting about it for us is it provides both access to a set of information to help folks kind of better understand the grant making process and decode some of the, the technical aspects of transportation. It provides a portal to access all of the existing technical assistance programs across the department. Uh, regardless of what type of transportation project you're trying to support, and also links up to the department's many resources that we have available to really understand the build program. We also have the specific thriving communities program I'll talk about in a minute. We also are going to be launching some additional technical assistance programs really tailored to targeting disadvantaged communities, under-resourced communities who are new to getting DOT grants to help expedite uh, the process for them to begin the work and improve their, their opportunity to really succeed in delivering transformative projects. And then uh, last, but by no means least, we are working not just at DOT, but with our federal partners across the whole of government to really think how can we leverage and align with each other in places and across programs to meet the administration's commitments to Justice 40, environmental justice and serving uh, uh, disadvantaged communities, as well as to meeting the promise of the uh, infrastructure investment. So next page, please. So with the technical assistance that we're able to provide through thriving communities, again, DOT, uh, this year we have 25 million for the program, HUD has $5 million. We are working closely together to develop our notices of funding opportunity to select capacity builders who will then be available to work with communities across the country, uh, supporting different cohorts who are working to advance different goals in their communities. Um, we will be uh, really working to see how, again, we can meet and structure those overall goals so that we're helping more communities successfully access resources, uh, engage in inclusive, um, community engagement opportunities, and really identify innovative financing partnerships 
uh, and, and intersectionality across projects and doing that in a way really tailored to the unique needs of each community. Uh, we are looking for opportunities that we can support cross-sector collaboration and also engage our regional staff and offices, again, across the, the whole of government to be working with and supporting uh, communities, making it easier to find out where are those resources, be they federal, be they philanthropic, be they private uh, or public resources to really advance projects, um, the whole of the project and not just the concept um, that might be available going forward. The language for this program specifically calls out philanthropy as one of the partners we can be working with uh, together with capacity builders that may be familiar to you that you're uh, funding in your communities or as national intermediaries. Next slide, please. So with all of this, there is a lot that's happening across the department as we're really looking at opportunities where we can do better, where we can partner, with others who are in this work of providing technical assistance and supporting communities, uh, as well as really opportunities that we can better align and leverage so that every community has the resources it needs to really meet this moment of opportunity that Christopher and Linda were talking about. So I will pause there for Q&A. And there is our contact information. Great, thank you um, very much, um, Maria, Linda, and Christopher. Um, before I turn to, um, I'm going to go to Naomi um, for some response and reaction, but I wonder, um, I've been jotting down some questions that um, I think I'd like to ask now if I could. And um, I'm just curious about um, who's talking to and what's happening with those local elected officials and the local units of government, since they actually are ones that receive money nonprofits don't get money directly out of this bill from directly from the transportation department, right? So um, what kind of messages um, are the local elected official groups getting related to things like equity and equitable dist distribution and how to engage those non-traditional voices in those underserved communities? I mean, what, what, what should, it's not just us, but it's really what messages are they getting and what are you doing to bring them to the table? Christopher, I see you nodding, nodding, nodding. So maybe I'll ask you to respond to that. Oh, certainly. And I know my colleagues, Linda and Maria, will have uh, additional to add. Um, but a couple of things. First, I want to just make a quick, uh, friendly amendment. Um, while it's true traditionally, um, traditional transportation dollars normally do flow to your state DOTs and POS transit yard traditional grant recipients. But for the first time, uh, whether it's through our reconnecting or our thriving communities program, we have the ability to fund directly community-based organizations. Um, so I think that is one element. Secondly, um, one of the things that uh, we have been doing, again, this goes to that hard and soft power particularly during our discretionary pro, uh, dollars, our grant programs, we have actually put as part of our criteria to the extent that applicants can demonstrate that they are partnering with local organizations, that they've actually done extensive uh, community engagement, they've done some of the initial equity analysis or have developed equitable plans around their transportation projects. Um, and we go even a step further where we're trying to encourage applicants to identify whether it's local project agreements, uh, local, uh, local hire opportunities. So where we're also getting not only the disparity studies and community engagement voices, but how we're also tied to the wealth creation. So that's just one example. Um, but also, I would also uh, flag that I know my colleague Linda and Charles and others have been working very closely with a number of mayors uh, who have been very supportive of some of these initiatives. And I know as part of the Thriving Communities Work that Maria is doing, we are really looking to partner with those mayors to bring that partnership, where we're bringing the community and even the private sector together to work on these major projects. But I'll let my colleagues Linda and Maria provide additional uh, color. Thanks, Christopher. And, you know, I would rem be remiss if I didn't call out our best and most amazing asset, and that is the secretary himself. I mean, he is um, regularly out there meeting with, um, talking to local and state leaders, and also using, you know, his microphone to make sure that people understand um, President Biden's commitment to equity writ large all across the administration, but also the laser focus that we've had here at DOT. We have incredible colleagues in our um, governmental affairs office who also host um, regular convenings, office hours, conversations, uh, calls with uh, state and local leaders. And 
we've had the great privilege of partnering with a number of folks that are on this call right now um, on different efforts that are underway to make sure that we're able to get some of the technical details out about each of these uh, grant opportunities and, and um, new initiatives and programs that are coming out, but then also just to be able to engage in an ongoing dialogue and Q&A with them as they're working through this entire process. So um, certainly very, very mindful of, of the um, state and local elected leadership role and you know, always interested in additional ideas that you all may have based on the experiences that you've been through in past programming, past collaborations with the federal government, that might be some best practices that we can draw on to do our work better as we continue to iterate on that process. I just add one uh, additional addendum. Um, in our interagency work, something that's been really exciting uh, to see is we have the opportunity with many of these programs to expand what we mean by local government. So like in conversations we've been having with HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Center for Disease Control, they've been supporting and funding a lot of work with local community health departments and frontline organizations working on public health and community safety issues. So we've been, we're in an active conversation of how our programs could leverage and align with their programs and their stakeholders and their constituents. And we're seeing lots of those different efforts across the government when we really kind of get out of our silos and look at what are the, the issues that people are trying to move forward and collectively, who is this broader ecosystem, many of whom philanthropy is also supporting and bringing together. And the more we can have these cross-sector uh, discussions, I think that's where we see funding that CDC may be putting in or a community foundation may be putting in could be really helpful to that local match that then can access DOT funds. So um, lots of those conversations are happening. Great. Great. Um, so Naomi, um, what kind of conversations are you having in Denver? <laughs> Yes, um, first off, really excited to be a part of this conversation and hear all the amazing work happening and we will echo I think one of the speakers shared about Secretary Buttigieg and how he really um, comes out to community. He was in Denver, I think a few weeks ago, some of my colleagues had an opportunity to meet with them. So it was so great to see um, just leadership here on the ground talking to our leaders about kind of the vision we have for transportation. There is a lot happening in the metro region and across the state as we think about transportation. Um, this past legislative session, there was an investment for um, zero fare transit that's going to be implemented in August, which is a really exciting way to get people using our transit system um, at the state level. Last legislative session, um, there was a big transportation funding bill um, that was now going to be going into effect that'll provide state dollars. But I think for us, we're really excited about federal dollars coming into Colorado to help enhance and kind of guide our um, efforts as we think about improving multimodal transportation, as we think about um, furthering our electric vehicle infrastructure here in the state. Um, for the Denver Foundation, and just for background, we are the largest community foundation in the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, transportation is a newer focus for us, not only from a grant making perspective, but from a public policy and advocacy perspective. So a lot of the work that I'm doing through committees that I sit on and just relationships that I have and in building are trying to understand, you know, what community organizations want to see in terms of programs in the communities that they serve, um, where are the opportunities for them to find additional funding to support their work, either through a programmatic standpoint or from driving systems changes, especially as we think about um, transit and transportation access and affordability for a lot of the reasons that were brought up um, from the very staff members from the Department of Transportation. So I think there's a really great opportunity um, for foundations to bring together the organizations they fund to not only make them aware of these opportunities for grants, especially now hearing that nonprofits can actually apply directly for these federal dollars, but also um, make sure that they're included in the conversations as we think about um, discussions for planning and actual implementation and trying to make sure that the dollars are going into those communities that have had the least amount of investment for um, the various transportation options that they need to get to their jobs, get to their health care um, options, get their get to school or just get to the places that they need to go to live their, their everyday lives. Um, it was so exciting as well to hear to about equity and just the objectives that are outlined within the, the agency's plan, but also in the implementation of these dollars, but also seeing dollars that will help in actually doing the work and the planning that's associated with that. 
Um, so I'm really excited to see that emphasis and really trying to ensure that the dollars are going to those communities that need it the most and have been, you know, typically left behind as we think about funding. So a lot of great things to come. Uh, you know, for me personally, I'm excited to share this recording and the resources with the various stakeholders that I work with and help be a conduit as we think about funding and just further conversations on how this um, the dollars will be working here in Colorado. Thank you so much, Naomi, and I, I had the privilege of being with him for that uh, visit to Denver uh, a few weeks ago, and, you know, we had the opportunity to visit the um, TOD uh, project over there in the Mariposa area with your governor and senators, and to see the um, electric vehicle charging station that had been installed there, that uh, area residents, uh, some of the lower income folks in particular were able to access, but also just to see this kind of broad thinking that has happened as a part of your really hard work in Denver. Um, I, I call this out um, not only because it was fun just to be there in person, but also because we're always looking for these kinds of stories as well. Again, because we wanna use him as our you know, effective and, and best bully pulpit person, but also because it's great best practices that we can then share out and hopefully inspire others to get involved in similar ways. So thank Thank you all so much for all of that work. Great. Um, Naomi, I can see you're very excited. <laughs> I love all things transportation. And it comes through. <laughs> yes, all things transportation. And just before, before um, I move to Crystal, I wanted just to ask you, so how is the community responding to the community foundation's embrace of this transportation as kind of a new priority and, and, and policy and advocacy? I think they're excited. Um, I think for our organization, really, when we we made, we came to that point through the development of our strategic framework that's going to guide our work for the next decade. And so through feedback from community, that issue of transportation really elevated. And it also came across, too, as we think about other focus areas that we've adopted. So environment and climate and air quality and affordable housing. You know, we, we realize that all of these issues are really in, interconnected. So the ability for us to speak up around, you know, service opportunity changes or um, funding opportunities to really further our transportation investments um, is really exciting. And I think our partners are really eager to have another voice in, in their advocacy efforts. Great. Great, thank you. Um, and I will tell um, everybody in the audience, um, post any questions you have for your peers too, um, and any uh, any questions or comments that you would like to make um, to our, our federal colleagues as well. So I'm, I'm gonna ask Crystal if you would go next and react to what you heard. And I know that Siemens has had a long focus on workforce development and apprenticeships and skill training and career pathways. I mean, if if there was ever um, an opportunity, I think this infrastructure bill uh, provides a really strong opportunity for good paying jobs and skill development. So I'm going to turn it to you next. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and let me add my appreciation as well to our colleagues um, from the Department of Transportation, as well as uh, those with me on the panel today, my fellow funders and everyone just joining into this conversation. Building this awareness and ecosystem is so important uh, across all of these various kind of uh, sectors that this work is gonna touch. So appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. As you heard Stephanie say, uh, we enter into this dialogue from the foundation's perspective, uh, largely focused through the lens of what we can really bring to bear. For, for me, that's my, our portfolio and workforce development, really advancing apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship models, other types of proven and promising really high quality education and training programming that not only prepares us uh, with an inclusive and diverse workforce and, and tackle some of these major equity challenges, uh, but then also really helps strengthen that those various types of um, uh, workforces across transportation, across electrification, uh, and just so many different areas the infrastructure bill touches. Um, so, you know, for those who may not be as familiar with Siemens, they are a major uh, stakeholder in what's happening across the infrastructure uh, landscape, particularly when it comes to the EV chargers. Uh, we, they're so excited about this work, being a partner uh, in really advancing some of these ESG goals across our country and, and seeing us uh, grow in that area. Uh, I wanted to just really highlight 
some of the, the ways that we're getting deeper into this kind of cross section between economic opportunity uh, and the infrastructure investments, which are just truly historical uh, in so many ways. But especially if you're someone like me who has spent decades in education and workforce development, this is money like we've never seen. Uh, to open doors to opportunities. And it's so uh, um, important and just, I am so delighted to hear this emphasis on equity and ensuring that this is an opportunity to open doors and not just do kind of that economic investment. So uh, just such a historical milestone here. So for us at the foundation, we started really advancing into this by um, going with what we know. And uh, right now that's in our workforce development space. We had spent the last five years in a partnership with the Gov National Governors Association, uh, really to just do some handholding with states that were gonna be committed uh, to moving forward high quality work-based learning uh, throughout their K-12 post-secondary and workforce development systems, including apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship. So when the infrastructure bill passed, it was a very opportune time for us to really go to that pool of 20 plus states and say, who is doing this well? What can we do in this moment in time with the bipartisan bill uh, to, to prepare states? Um, for us, that meant really going in there, looking at who was really ready uh, to take advantage of this opportunity um, and then help them marry uh, so many of these, what in too many cases are diverse sectors across things like your transportation state leaders, your workforce state leaders, your education state leaders. So many, uh, uh, just like at the federal level, unfortunately, sometimes that takes a lot of coordination and there just may not be as much funding upfront to make that happen. So we're really focused on how can we build those partnerships, build those bridges uh, to, to make that easier for states to be able to draw down that funding, really advance quickly, on things like pre-apprenticeships, registered apprenticeships where they exist, but with a clear, clear focus um, on, on equity along the way. So that work has just kicked off in May. We're currently working with four states to do that. Hopefully it turns into a learning community from those four states so that it uh, will grow beyond just those, that specific grant investments there. Uh, and the goal is really, like I said, to build those connections so that where we can um, advance timing and move the ball forward more quickly, we can kind of make um, existing connections between folks who are doing pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship well, uh, and really help the transportation folks take advantage of this, of this new opportunity across funding. Um, and I would say, you know, the second thing I'd like to highlight is that we, like so many others, have taken a really deep dive on what we can be doing better when it comes to advancing racial equity through all of our work. For us, not only does that mean unpacking uh, what we can do better, how we can support partners in doing that through our workforce and our education investments, but it meant for us also then uh, investing differently in different types of activities. So if we were serious about providing uh, supportive services, wraparound support for individuals to succeed, that meant for us to make different decisions too. So we have started uh, new lines of permanent work and things like health disparities, uh, and that's gonna move as well into sustainability. So uh, as we're looking forward to the next few fiscal years, we're really trying to identify what's that right spot where we can bring our experience and workforce education, STEM, other areas to bear uh, into this, this discussion. Uh, in the infrastructure funding, but specifically through the lens of sustainability and economic opportunity for these uh, populations we want to serve. Uh, so we are excited about these possibilities here. Would love to uh, have the opportunity to build connections with our colleagues um, in the funding community, as well as in government and see how we can be most supportive. And I think in terms of, um, kind of the, the question, you know, at the top of my mind with our uh, DOT folks here is that there, there's so much to unpack, right? This is, it's almost as if fire hose <laughs> coming at our states, our cities and others. Um, you know, I think it would be really helpful for us to hear more about how could we, uh, as the funding community best step in and support these goals around equity and around the um, infrastructure funding. What is 
how can you see us really um, stepping into that gap? What is it? And then how can we stay connected, not only with you, but with each other as this progresses um, and making sure that things are, uh, that we're, we're able to at least uh, to measure and, imp and how our impact is going. Um, I, I want to just make one small plug, Crystal, especially because you started off talking about um, workforce and apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs. So it just so happens that literally right now, at the same time as this call, the White House and our uh, director of Bipartisan Infrastructure Law di um, Implementation, uh, Katie Thompson, they are hosting another webinar that's specifically about the White House Talent Pipeline Challenge, which is designed to encourage uh, increased investment in specifically apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs. So I want to make sure that folks have that information. But then I thought uh, Christopher and Maria probably have a lot of thoughts uh, to answer this particular question, and maybe Christopher could start. I'll uh, for a second time. I'll turn over to Maria and I'll just follow up. Maria, you want to jump in? Uh, yes, happy to. Um, so one thing I I like just for my own sanity to keep in mind, but also in in working with communities, this is um, a five year funding program, but it's really even much longer term than that. We know transportation projects take a long time, so I think we have both like a sense of the fire hose is happening right now and that can be a, a little overwhelming and so like it's good to be refreshed and get wet and and cool off with that fire hose but step back a little bit and remember like there will be multiple years of this coming so it's not like oh i missed the opportunity right now i you know what am i going to do it's more okay this year you're now seeing our notices of funding opportunity coming out chances are they'll look pretty similar in the coming years. So with these uh, funding opportunities, how are we setting in place those tables, those processes, starting to make some of those investments in workforce development, which is something we're clearly prioritizing in our funding programs, in equity, in really supporting new places, places that have been underlooked, places that are under-resourced, making sure that they are benefiting from these projects. So. All, there's so much that can be happening to kind of put in place, enable people to start having those conversations, start developing those partnerships, moving projects from an idea or early planning to be becoming more ready. We're really trying to think about with our technical uh, assistance, how we can prioritize that need too. So um, again, it, it's not like you've missed it this year. So sorry, not, you know, see you later. Uh, it, it really is a, a long-term opportunity. So I think that's step one. Step two, transportation planning, the good and the bad news is, is that it is, it is a pretty, you know, federally regulated process. So you do need to work with your state DOTs. You do need to work with the regional transportation planning organizations for much of the money. We do have some of these exceptional programs, but a lot of them, there is a specific process. And so you don't want to be missing out on that. And I saw a question of like, how do we know what projects are getting funded in our region? you should absolutely be in conversation and pulling conversations together with your metropolitan planning organizations or others to like make sure you're aware and you're helping uh, to shape what those projects are. I'll turn to you, Christopher. Yeah, no, um, Murray, I think you, you covered uh, some of the major, only thing, the, the two things I will add is that um, it is very important to um, consider the full ecosystem of capacity building. I know oftentimes we think about the community-based organization, the nonprofit that we work with, maybe with the local uh, government. But right now, state DOTs, transit agencies, and MPO are in desperate need of holding space to learn, to also, but also as they're developing their state and regional transition plans, how can we, how could they incorporate equity? How could they ensure that the projects they're identifying are meeting their climate goals? And that includes research, that includes data gathering, and that also includes bringing voices to the table. And so, Crystal, your first question, you know, on the table is like, yes, you, foundations and flaming, you have been doing the work, but it's also making sure that you're open the space where those decision makers can be a part of the conversation. The second thing, and I'll just in here, in terms of GAT, it is really, um, I think, in a moment of urgency for philanthropy to put a, a flag in the ground today and recognize that 
Um, while it is true, this bill is a five-year bill and we are looking to have an infrastructure decade. But I think one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that right now sets the tone for the next 10 years. And so to the extent for us, our, from our perspective, you can imagine we are looking to prioritize places where we know we can work with individuals and groups to move it, a conversation forward, a process forward, a project forward. And to the extent that philanthropy at the regional level, as well as the national level, can actually cement their organization, right? The apparatus that allows us to have a uh, holistic and comprehensive discussion versus ad hoc one-off discussions or using, I would say, Maria, Linda and I, who have personal relationships and we just kind of work with you guys for many years where we had to pick up the phone, but versus having a more centralized uh, national perspective. So those are the two things I would like just put on the table. Um, and of course, you know, we will love to give more color on some of the things you may have said offline if that's necessary. Yeah, the, the last thing I would just say, um, just to double click on this point Christopher's making about the urgency of now is that Yes, there, these programs will continue. We will have these resources for the relative near term. But um, as the Secretary often says, we have to make sure that the American people feel $1.2 trillion of value right now. And part of that, if we're going to achieve some of our equity goals that we just laid out, is also making sure that those disadvantaged communities, those folks who have always felt like they are left out of the decision-making conversation, see themselves in the programs and the projects that we're doing now. And that is, you know, part of what, part of that we can do, part of that we can lift up and, and use that bully pulpit, but a huge part of that and where uh, we see a gap is on the overall broad narrative storytelling side of things, which as we all know that are part of this conversation and have been doing this work for a really long time is actually best done at the local level with those trusted local messengers, with those folks that you feel like really get the challenges that you have day to day. If you hear uh, to the point that was made a little bit earlier about uh, that Steffi made about engaging local leaders, if you hear your mayor, your city councilman, your um, block captain talking about this project getting done because of the bipartisan infrastructure law and seeing the benefits of a family that you might know down the block, that's going to be obviously so much more impactful than anything that we can do from the federal level. Great, and I'm, I wrote down, I don't want to lose um, the point that Crystal made and the question she had about how funders can kind of stay connected with you all, maybe for ongoing and continuing conversation. And I think that's something maybe that um, we can talk about afterwards, about what kind of you know, forum could could maybe we help to provide um, for say ongoing conversation, quarterly phone calls or something like that. So let's be thinking about that. Um, I'm going to turn to Shauna now, and uh, Shauna, tell us, you know, what's Kellogg Foundation? What's on their mind about all this? Well, thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to everyone for for joining the call today. It's it's been um, fantastic to hear updates from our colleagues at the Department of Transportation, and truly a treat to hear from Naomi and Crystal about how my colleagues are approaching this um, opportunity right now. Um, I'm grateful to share a little bit about why Kellogg's excited about what's coming up, and um, share just some general thoughts and reflections and things that we're grappling with right now. So at the WK Kellogg Foundation, we are interested in maximizing the potential impact of the department's mandate through the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as their commitments in, the, in their equity action plan, because we recognize how infrastructure intersects with our three focus areas, which are education equity, employment equity, and health equity. As we've heard today, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is a very big deal, and it creates an unprecedented opportunity to make transformational changes throughout our country. Uh, for us, the act can advance equity in communities with relation to community engagement, job creation, job training, and overall resilience. Specifically, we hope that the department's efforts will accomplish three major outcomes and want to offer our thought partnership and connections whenever helpful. First, strengthening 
uh, connections to communities through intentional outreach to underserved populations, especially communities of color who have long bore the brunt of inequitable policies. Second, increase access to resources for underserved and marginalized communities by learning from folks with lived experiences about the ways existing procurement and grant processes prevent their full participation and subsequently providing tar targeted technical assistance to help communities and underrepresented businesses navigate federal processes. And third, Third, advance shared prosperity and wealth creation by ensuring that projects and communities are not extractive and can employ local workers, encouraging and incentivizing job training and upskilling of the workforce, and structuring competitive grant processes to ensure participation from organizations led by people of color and other underrepresented populations. As a philanthropy that seeks to center racial equity in our work, and one that collaborates across diverse stakeholders, including the private sector, we know it takes intention and commitment to do this work, and it's rarely easy. Philanthropies like ours can be a resource and thought partner for this journey. Um, and please know you can always call on us for help, like we're around, we're available. Um, we can help be a connector to communities, we can hold spaces for collaborations and convenings, we can share learnings and best practices, a lot of what Naomi and Crystal have already shared. And one piece that we always like to, to lift up and mention is as, as we look to our grantees and the communities we serve for guidance and, and accountability, we are here to support communities as they do the same for the department. We're excited uh, by these plans and look forward to opportunities to partner and, and just uh, being mindful of the time I'll wrap up and with another just big thank you to everyone on the call and I'm very excited to hear uh, questions from the other participants on the line and all the things they're thinking about. Great, thank you um, very much. Um, so I wanted to uh, also acknowledge that we did have uh, a question that two, two questions that came in through the Q&A function. And I think we did um, answer Yuriana. She was asking, how will they know what projects are taking place or being considered in their areas? And maybe just to kind of reiterate that, the answer to that it sounded to me like what you all were saying is, um, that they need to be, people need to be in touch with their local and state DOT officials. Would that be correct? Yeah, I, I would say uh, check in with your, if you are in a larger metro area, your metropolitan planning organization, um, your state DOT. We also have um, regional staff and uh, state division staff um, on our DOT dot gov slash navigator we can share that with you there's a link where you can get the contact information for our state contacts um they are also there as a resource and so if you're having conversations about transit you know feel free to reach out and engage our regional staff and they may be a good resource to let you know especially on the formula funds which which a lot of times they may be more in tune of what things the transit agencies in your region are supporting so uh, i'll share that link yeah, and I would just add that at the at the national level, um, if it's helpful, we can always serve as you know your guidepost. So if you wanted to reach out to Christopher Maria or or me uh, to ask any initial questions or to share with us where you're focused, uh, Shauna, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with Lejeune a few weeks ago in um, Michigan, and I, I don't think the secretary would mind me saying we were quite blown away by you know your overall vision and her leadership and where you all are focused both in that private sector activation but also in your engagement with local leaders we're back again to the the um, state and local leaders uh, comment from earlier and it's really helpful for us to hear what your priorities are right now and then we can also from our end look at our priorities and try to figure out where things align and where we can just augment amplify and you know that popular term be force multipliers for each other so please don't hesitate to reach out to the three of us anytime and you know it does uh, i think beg the question for me too is um do those state and local leaders need maybe a little philanthropy 101 kind of sessions? Um, forgive my cynical self, but um, I'm not sure that many of them really understand what the potential role for philanthropy can be and the kind of leadership that philanthropy can bring to the table to help them achieve the kind of goals that the federal legislation is requiring. And so I'm wondering if we need to be thinking of 
having those kind of sort of elementary conversations too. Just, I'm just curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah, Stephanie, I, I don't think it's cynical at all. I, I think that, um, I think we're safe to say that in the past few years, there's been a little bit of a um, step back from the philanthropic community. Um, and uh, those who are leading right now may just not have had that exposure experience. And I think, you know, they can self-select if you all are interested in pulling something together, they can self-select, we can help you know, amplify uh, whatever programming you've got going on and, and get the right folks in the room so that they can access that information. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm sort of thinking about maybe maybe some cross conversations between the National Association of Counties and council members, for instance, or the, Chris was talking about the NGA, the National Governors Association. I mean, that's a way to go to scale um, with certain kind of messaging to get out to the far corners, you know, of the country to local elected officials as well. So um, I wrote that down too as maybe a, a potential follow up. Um, so Leslie Gross had a question. I know Christopher, you did kind of write her an answer, but um, maybe there we could speak to it a little bit more. It sounds like um, she represents a network of 400 individual donors which is a little bit, I mean, it's different than certainly um, foundation and, you know, foundation sort of strategy and strategic objective. Um, it sounds like they might have some money that can be used fast, fungibly, et cetera. Um, and they can incubate programs. They can maybe do some things, you know, really quickly based on what the, the quick need is. So um, how to connect those donors uh, you know, into things like timelines. Should they also be talking maybe as individual donors to um, st state and local DOT officials, have them come to you as well, certainly advertise your contact information. Christopher, you wanna? Uh, well, I'll just jump in. Uh, Stephanie, I think my aspect back to Elizabeth was basically, please reach out to Maria, please reach out to Linda, reach out to me, and I will definitely plug and play. Um, there are, and I think one of the things that is quite remarkable about the time we're in now, is that we're not, this is not a, just a DOT thing. We are working across government. Um, our equity strategy is a whole of government approach. Our justice 40 strategy is a whole of government approach. And of course the bipartisan infrastructure law, it has implicated um, um, whether it's Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, USDA, EPA, and so many others. And so uh, for us, we are looking at opportunistic moments, not within DOT, but also with our sister agencies where we could be more tactful um, and rapid response in addition to the long-term planning. So definitely please plug into us. We'll definitely plug into those as well. Great, terrific. Um, are there any other comments, questions from our audience? I don't see any in the Q&A and I don't see any in the chat, Caroline. Caroline has been posting like crazy, I think, lots of the resources. Um, since we are coming up to our time now, um, we will be sending out um, all of these resources. So we'll package them all up in a follow-up email to um, all of uh, everybody who has registered. And, uh, and then we will disseminate those to the council's broader network uh, of membership as well. Um, is there any last words, um, Christopher, Linda, Maria, that you would like to um, make as, as departing comments? I think on behalf of the of Secretary Buttigieg and um, and the entire team here, we're just really grateful just to have a space. Um, this is a unique moment in time uh, for us to refocus, double down on the great work that's already happening. And I think really in many cases, um, the Secretary has said it many, many times, we've had previous administrations, previous secretaries, um, where we wanted, we said all the right things, but now this time we actually have money to do those things. And so, um, if there's anything left here, there's no excuse for us not to be able to look back 20 years from now and said, we actually did it right. Um, and we changed the course of how infrastructure plays in the lives of so many Americans. And so with that, uh, we're really excited. Uh, I know my team here is as well, and we stand ready to work in partnership. Excellent. Excellent. And I, I will end with this. Um, when uh, we had our prep call for this, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, um, I said to Christopher, what's our big message to funders? And he said to me, time to get off the sidelines and get in the game. And so I'd like to end with that and thank um, my colleagues from the foundations, Crystal, Naomi, and Shauna also for being with us today. 
Uh, I'm excited because you're excited. So I'm excited about transportation now. <laughs> so thank you all. Caroline, is there anything we need to do to wrap up? No, thank you, Stephanie and everyone. That was excellent. We'll send the recording and the links in an email by the end of the week. Uh, please share with your networks and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the day. Stay cool. <laughs>